Hello again, everyone. I am here with Jacob Efron, principal at uh, Redpoint Ventures. And Jacob, what a pleasure it is to have you on the show. Welcome. Patty, thanks so much for having me on. A big fan of the podcast, so it's great to be on. That's so kind of you to say. Well, let's let's start with a little bit of an introduction to your firm and your role in the firm, and uh, then we can jump into the uh, whole digital health landscape, which I'm, I'm really excited about uh, exploring with you. Sounds great. No, it's always uh, always interesting to chat about. So, you know, maybe I'll start with Redpoint and then just give a bit of background on myself. Uh, so, Redpoint is a fund. You know, we're kind of a, a classic Silicon Valley venture firm. We've been around since the late '90s. Um, and done a series of kind of, you know, the heritage of the funds really on the enterprise software, data infrastructure, other category side. So companies like Stripe and Snowflake and Twilio and HashiCorp and Ramp, and Nubank. Um, but in the last decade, have gone into healthcare in a big way. So it's actually about a quarter of our fund now. Um, and, you know, the way we think about it is really bringing kind of the best of enterprise software, data tools, consumer experience, fintech uh, that we've come to expect kind of in every other part of our lives uh, into, into healthcare. And so as a firm, we've invested in companies like CityBlock and Galileo and Strive, Acuity MD, Garner, Hims, Tend, uh, a whole host of, uh, of really exciting companies. Um, and that's that's kind of where I spend my time, you know, in terms of my quick background. You know, I joined, uh, I kind of started on the healthcare policy side in college and then, you know, started my career over at McKinsey working with state Medicaid agencies, payers, providers, pharma companies. Uh, I then went over to Flatiron Health, which was a company that was doing big data for cancer treatment um, to help start a new business line there. And, you know, eventually uh, joined the product team, uh, helped kind of build workflow tools for cancer centers we worked with. Uh, and then after we got acquired, I switched over to the venture side and have been at Redpoint for the last two and a half years. Awesome. Awesome. And for our, for our listeners, uh, Flatiron was acquired by Roche. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so let's let's jump right into the digital health landscape. You mentioned that your firm's been uh, investing in the healthcare tech landscape for the last decade or so. And during this time, the whole digital health funding cycle, in fact, even the business models for digital health startups has kind of gone through a couple iterations. Uh, and right now we're living through a moment as it were, you know, what a difference a year makes. A year ago, everyone <laughs> was celebrating the blowout funding numbers for digital health startups. And it sounds like what we're seeing now, maybe a blowing up of some of these companies and uh, potentially uh, the venture capital funding that's needed to keep these companies going. Give us your state of the union on where we are with digital health, especially the younger companies. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it, it's it's actually, you know, one of the interesting parts of being at a firm that does healthcare and other things is you kind of get perspective on, on what's happening across spaces. And so I'd say, you know, what's happening in healthcare uh, is, is probably actually happening, you know, pretty uniformly in other spaces that venture capital firms invest in too, which is that you have a series of later stage companies that raised uh, rounds last year when the market was uh, was roaring and, and people thought good times were, were exclusively ahead. And now that the public markets have really corrected in every space, uh, in, you know, in software and fintech and healthcare, uh, it's really, you know, a lot of people don't know, you know, how, what is, what are these later stage healthcare companies worth? Um, and so I think what that means, you know, I kind of bifurcate what's happening in, in digital health investing right now to early stage and later stage. On the later stage side, I think, you know, there's a, just a bit of confusion as to what are these companies worth? You know, people are waiting to see the public markets are moving around so much. Uh, and there's not that many healthcare companies that are public. So there's not that many examples to point to that are analogous to a lot of these startups. And so I think in that environment of confusion, you know, folks may be a little bit reticent to invest in some of those later stage healthcare companies. Um, and so, you know, I think the what what folks are advising these, you know, a lot of the later stage companies is, you know, look, that's a period of uncertainty, you know, make sure you've got runway uh, to, you know, kind of see it through to, to greener times. Like, you know, I, I think, uh, and, and the overarching theme I'd say is like, all the macros that are driving healthcare, and this is really relevant to the early stage, they're all still there. None, none of that's changed because of the, the current environment. It's not like last year, you know, the healthcare cost curve was going up a ton, and this year it's suddenly flattened. Or last year, you know, uh, there was all a need for technology and providers, payers, pharma, and that suddenly changed. And so all the thematic reasons that make digital health really interesting are still there. And so I think for early stage companies, for really, you know, strong teams and going after interesting problems, I, I don't think the market has changed, you know, dramatically there. Uh, I think it's really these later stage companies where there's just kind of uncertainty about how they should be priced. Yeah. And so from your firm standpoint, uh, 
uh, I imagine, and from, from, from the research I've done, your firm invests, invests in every stage, uh, in, you know, from seed all the way to later round C and D and so on. Have you changed uh, focus in, in light of what's happening in the macro environment? And are you investing more in one stage versus another now? What, what, how's your firm looking at this? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, it's it's actually you know pretty much honestly uh, the same stage focus that we've had you know traditionally, and I think uh, you know certainly there's there's kind of opportunities across the board, but even you know I, I think in, in, it's interesting, right, in that kind of dislocation of of saying, hey, you know, no one knows how to price some of these you know growth rounds. They're actually become interesting opportunities, right? I mean, there are some like great later stage healthcare companies uh, that are in the private markets uh, that you know maybe they were planning to IPO, and now it's not really a great time to do that. And so, you know, I think there's actually, you know, there continue to be more interesting opportunities across the board. You know, it's, it's just that, uh, you know, maybe last year those deals would have priced at a certain price and now they're, they're not pricing, uh, you know, uh, at, at that. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that uh, a lot of the downbeat news from many of these uh, firms that have raised a lot of money, uh, namely, the layoffs, uh, as an example, yeah. that is very much in the news. And I imagine, you know, it, that VCs also have a part to play in advising their portfolio companies about the kind of actions they need to take to, to maintain that runway, as you, as you mentioned. What are you hearing from the entrepreneurs themselves? What are you hearing from the founders who are running these companies? What are they telling you about the demand environment and their own operations and the talent and all of that? Yeah, um, well, a lot there. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, you know start on on the talent side. You know, I actually think there's an interesting opportunity on the talent side for digital health where, you know, I, I think in the past, historically, you know, maybe large tech companies have been able to pay salaries that, you know, dwarf what any digital health company can pay. And so anytime you've got kind of this inflection in the market as a whole, I think it's like an interesting dislocation where it forces, you know, people to reconsider like, oh, you know, I thought, you know, I had all these options and I thought they were going to be worth so much money that I had golden handcuffs and I was going to stay at this, you know, at Facebook forever. Um, and now, you know, people are rethinking that. And so I think, you know, one trend I've seen across the board is uh, just folks want to do more mission-driven work that's meaningful to them. I, I talk to people all the time and they're like, you know, I want to go into healthcare or climate, right? Like that's, you know, that that's where they want to spend time. And I think, you know, for a while, I think it's actually a really interesting talent market. I, I think across the board in our portfolio companies, we're seeing like just incredible engineers, product people that, you know, maybe they're using this current environment as, as a inflection point to think about, okay, what do I want to do with this this next stage of my career? So on the talent side, I think, you know, I, I hope to see kind of this continued influx of folks into the digital health space, uh, which which I think is really interesting. And then, you know, I think on the um, on the customer side, you know, I guess a classic investor thing, you know, that has always made people interested in healthcare is that it, it is, you know, in many ways counter cyclical, right? Like I think there's kind of this fear in software at large right now that like all these startups sell to other startups and the second the music stops and, and, you know, there's, there's not as many startups out there, like do all these companies start missing plan or, or whatnot. Um, and I think that like actually in healthcare, a lot of our customers, you know, a lot of our companies, sorry, they sell, you know, to employers or they sell to uh, like large employers or they sell to, uh, you know, hospital systems or pharma companies. And certainly there's, there's tightenings of the belt across the board, but like, again, back to the original point, like the problems haven't changed. And, and if anything, like you have some companies that I think, you know, it's actually a really interesting uh, inflection point. Like we have one portfolio company, Garner Health, uh, that focuses on helping employers lower the cost of, of care and, and improving kind of the member experience. That's actually even more relevant in this current environment. Uh, they have a lot of folks uh, that, that are kind of seeing the, the premium cost for next year and saying, you know, in this economic environment, especially that that's something we really want to, uh, you know, want to tackle. So uh, health system, let's talk about health system. And that's a segment that my firm does a lot of work in. Yeah. Uh, every large health system has posted losses this year, without exception. And, you know, it'd totally. be hard for us to think of an exception to the rule. And I've, I've had uh, many conversations with the leaders in these companies. This is one of the most challenging years that they've had, and they don't see this uh, changing dramatically in the coming uh, year. And we'll talk about that uh, later as well. So this demand environment uh, consequently is kind of shrinking because they have less uh, disposable or discretionary funds. And there's a lot more scrutiny what uh, specifically if you talk about 
uh, you know, the employers is a separate segment, but let's, if yeah. you talk about the enterprises themselves, whether it's health plans or health systems, uh, what are you hearing from the market about the demand environment for digital health solutions? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, right? I think, uh, you know, on the health system side, uh, you know, you, you kind of, there, there's kind of, maybe if you were to bucket different kinds of solutions, there's stuff that feels like, hey, this is a point solution that just kind of does, you know, very one very specific thing, or, you know, this is something that seems cool, like, you know, it's a cool algorithm, or it's a cool kind of tool, but like, does it really have an ROI, like it's kind of unclear, still TBD. And I think, you know, we've always been kind of reticent to invest in some of that stuff. Uh, and I think in this environment, you're really going to see kind of a bifurcation of tools that that are kind of broad in scope that can really be partners for systems at like a much larger level and also tools that have real clinical and like financial studies behind them uh, and proof points and case studies with other systems uh, that, that they actually work. And so I think, you know, and you, you find the best. I mean, in this current environment, uh, it's a really hard time for systems right now. And so, you know, if you're going to a system and you want to talk about like a specific clinical application in one, you know, department that maybe has some clinical val validity, uh, you know, how much time are you going to get relative to the person that's like, hey, I understand the staffing challenges you have. And here's something that we're building around that. Or I understand, you know, let's talk about revenue cycle, or let's talk about, you know, uh, kind of patient engagement and keeping folks within your system. Or let's talk about, you know, some of these new, you know, value-based models you may be moving into. And, and I think like the, uh, the current environment, I think, you know, forces a prioritization that's, that's always kind of been there, right? I mean, it's always hard to sell to these systems and payers if you're not one of their top, you know, two, three priorities. Yeah, and you mentioned value-based care. So let's kind of, you know, click double click on that one. And, and I believe you've written about this as well, the, that startups now have to get creative about demonstrating the value, taking on risk perhaps, and, uh, and being able to put more money at risk in order to earn the right to a seat at the table. So totally. talk to us a little bit about how that's playing out. And I know you've written about this. So I'd love to hear your thoughts for the benefit of our audience. Yeah. So I think there's an increasing trend of, you know, of, of startups kind of moving from, you know, a, a fever service world to actually taking on risk for uh, the services they provide. And in some ways, it's, it's the ultimate kind of confidence in your own model to say, you know, we're not just showing you a, a pretty slide that says this thing saves money. We're so confident it does that we're willing to go at risk for, for that. And, you know, a few trends that have kind of happened that I think have really enabled that, um, you know, the first is uh, there's kind of been, you know, a lot of this stuff follows government policy, right? And there's been a lot of, I mean, as, as you all know, and I'm sure many of your listeners do, there's been a lot of government policies over the past decade and, and you know, even more in the last two, three years that have created these kind of interesting models that startups can then opt into, right? And I think a lot of times the government creates these models, like, you know, first it was ACOs, then kind of these kidney choice models, uh, now direct contracting and, and ACO reach. And, uh, you know, I think they just announced the enhanced oncology model, but, you know, there's a whole host of these different models the government introduces that then private payers also kind of uh, latch on to. And it creates this interesting opportunity for startups to, uh, to you know, provide care in a different way. And if you think about what a lot of these companies want to do anyway, I mean, they want to provide kind of like higher touch, you know, better consumer experience type care. And these payment models enable them to do that. And so I think there's a lot of promise in these kinds of businesses. There's early proof points that uh, you know, you have companies like Allidade and Oak Street that have demonstrated really interesting, you know, outcomes on both clinical outcomes and, and cost outcomes. Uh, and so I think, you know, a lot of folks will look at those companies and they'll also look at their valuations, you know, the way that Oak Street and Agilon and Allidade are, are all valued. And they'll say, that's, that seems like a, in, a way that we can do things that's in line with how we want to provide care and also is financially lucrative. Yeah. So healthcare, of course, is very, very good at following the money, as you know, and <laughs> And notwithstanding all the uh, excitement about alternate payment models and value-based care and risk-based and so on and so forth, reality is that the vast majority of healthcare payments still go through some kind of Completely. service model. Right? And that is at least in the health system world. And so a lot of the insurers are tied into that model. So fee-for-service rules, and that has a lot of implications for what gets invested in. You know, There has to be a direct line of sight to the investment between the investment dollar and the ultimate returns in terms of a, of a reimbursement. It, does this uh, square with uh, you know, what your startups are trying to do or, or is it safe to say that the, these models that you're talking about work better maybe for employers, but maybe not as much for health systems? Is there a nuance there that we should be thinking about? 
Yeah, well, a few thoughts on that. I mean, one, you know, uh, as you know, as you all know, it's healthcare is just so massive that like all these worlds can coexist and still be really big, right? So you've got like Oak Street, which you know, depending on the day, is five six billion dollar company. Iora, Chen Med, all these names people talk about um, that do a wonderful job and have created a lot of enterprise value, and they touch less than one percent of Medicare patients, right? And that's still they're still massive businesses. And then you've got the systems that are more in the fee for service world, uh, and, and so uh, you know. Yes, it, like I totally agree with the point that you know most, almost all payments in the system world are on the fee for service side now. It's obviously been slower to move to value based than maybe some of the independent physicians and, and groups. Uh, but both worlds can kind of coexist and still be pretty large for the time being. I do think it's 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 a really good point that on the system side, you have a lot of people that come in and they say, "Oh, we're gonna you know we're gonna sell value based care. We're gonna like do something that really works in those models." And again, it goes back to you know especially in this challenging time for systems. You can't go into a room pitching someone and, and talk about something that's not one of the you know top two or three things they're thinking about. And so, you know, a lot of times when we talk to early stage companies, you know, we encourage them if they're going to do something in the value based world that you know a lot of the innovation is really happening you know in the independent groups to start. Yeah, what do you think of the policy environment? Are there uh, one or two things that you would like to see, or do you anticipate in the near term that could make a difference to the picture? Yeah, I mean, I think that on the value-based care side, like the big policy question is whether any of these models are going to be made mandatory at some point, right? So if I think about how they've evolved, um, basically, you know, how these benchmarks get set of how much should it cost to take care of a population, it's it's a median, right, or an average. And so as you can imagine, uh, companies are very good at saying, um, well, you're in the top quartile of, of practices. So if you don't lift a finger or change anything, you will do better in this model than you were doing in the status quo because it was set at the median. And so, you know, you have a lot of practices that were in that top quartile saying, great, you know, value-based care sounds awesome. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a real way to, and, and like, it is good for healthcare to move to a different payment model. But I think what you've seen is some of those practices that maybe would need it the most or most need to transform, you know, there's no incentive or reason for them to, to opt into some of these models. And so I think the big question, you know, it's politically difficult. I don't envy the policymakers that have to, to do this, but, uh, you know, are these models going to have a little bit of teeth in them uh, where you start kind of like pushing people to make the transition? Because as long as you make it optional, there'll be some subset of folks that think they'll be better off in, in, in this kind of future world than they are today. Yeah. And so uh, when you look at your portfolio companies, uh, you, you mentioned some attributes, uh, you you mentioned that there is an influx of talent from other sectors that are that are uh, potentially ahead of healthcare, and there's a lot of sectors that are ahead of healthcare when it comes to adoption of innovation and technology. And of course, healthcare is conservative for a reason in their defense, uh, because there's a lot of patient safety issues. And there are some very unique attributes to healthcare itself: uh, the compliance aspects, uh, the data interoperability aspects and uh, patient safety aspects, just to name a few, that make healthcare unique and different. So when you have these entrepreneurs coming in from other sectors that are used to moving much faster because they're not, for want of a better word, shackled by any of these uh, uh, compliance and regulatory issues and other issues, what, what are some of the core attributes you look for when you look at funding one of these startups? What do you look at the entrepreneurs for? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, uh, like you said, I think sometimes a fresh perspective can be helpful, but obviously, you know, one needs to have a lot of humility with, with the U.S. healthcare system. And so, you know, I, I think one thing we really focus on is just, you know, I think it's a combination. It's first, you know, is someone just like a learning machine, right? I mean, like, you know, someone that just kind of really likes, because healthcare is so like endlessly nuanced and weird that you have to kind of like love that weirdness or find it interesting. Um, if you don't want to like ask the six or seven whys if something is the case, the way it is, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's really hard to kind of successfully build in the space. And so, you know, I think there, we get really excited by folks that, you know, maybe they've, they've been looking at, you know, uh, ambulatory surgery centers for three months, but they already, they, they've uncovered something in that, in that research. They just, they're, they're more fluent in that space than just about anybody you talk to. Um, and I think also then there's a, a humility of like, Hey, there's a lot that we don't know, you know, bringing the right folks around the table. Right. So if you're a technologist, you know, bringing kind of like someone that's an MD, someone that's like, you know, had a lot of experience in whatever it is you're doing and kind of forming that, that team. Right. Um, but the one thing I'd say actually that it gets me super excited about a lot of the companies we invest in is they're starting to be like this really interesting second generation of founders where you essentially, they were tech people, they moved into 
a first wave healthcare startup like Oscar or Flatiron or Hims or you know any of these companies that were really kind of popular from 20 call it 13 to 2019 and then they went to go form their healthcare startup and that's just incredibly exciting because those people are great technologists they have all the stuff you'd want in the traditional software world but they're not brand new to healthcare i mean they ran provider networks at oscar or they like they did something that's like in the weeds in healthcare um and so know the space really well and i think that uh kind of archetype of entrepreneur is is really exciting and i think the more you know the more folks that come into digital health you'll have that kind of second wave yeah that is a really really interesting point the second generation of entrepreneurs especially the ones that have gone through these wildly successful exits, you know, the Livongos of the world and so on and so forth. Exactly. Course, we are seeing many of those individuals move on to take leadership roles or in, in other uh, later stage startups or even starting their own companies. And uh, so we will wait to see what they do. And that is an exciting, that's a really good point. Let's talk a little bit about the competitive landscape for the startups today. And I want to focus specifically on just one element of the competitive landscape, which is big tech. Right. Yep. Oh, you've got, you know, you've got this vast ocean of thousands of digital health startups. They're all finding a little niche, a white space. Uh, they, you know, they're they're solutioning the heck out of it and doing a really good job for for the most part. But then you've got the big tech with the deep pockets. You know, think Amazon, think Salesforce, think Microsoft, think Google, Apple. They're all coming in. And Amazon, in particular which is kind of moving deeper and deeper into the core healthcare services space. What does this mean for smaller companies? Are they gonna get crowded out? Are they gonna get bought out? Are they, are they gonna coexist and increase the size of the pie? What's your take? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say like, you know, it's not something that we spend a lot of time thinking about, honestly. I think the hardest part is what we were talking about earlier, which is, you know, health systems are hurting how do you get your solution to matter for that health system? And nothing to do with the, the competitive landscape. It's just, you know, do you have a product that's compelling enough to go through all the hurdles that are required to get something adopted? Um, you know, as I think about the role of big tech, I mean, Lord knows the pie is big enough in healthcare. And like, there is a lot of technology that needs to be introduced into healthcare. And so if we just, if, if we start moving toward there being more solutions, I think there, there's plenty of pie. But if I were to reflect kind of on the role of big tech in healthcare today, you know, there's definitely kind of pieces that are interesting that folks are trying. Um, but I wouldn't say any of the big tech companies have really figured out how to have like an at scale impact in healthcare. And actually the Amazon one is a great example, right? They tried to build their own business and then ended up acquiring, you know, one medical, uh, you know, to th that, that had kind of come from the startup world. And so, you know, in some sense, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's always good to have more, you know, smart technologists working on the problem. And I think, you know, from a startup perspective, these are potential acquirers. So that's great as they want to do more in, in healthcare. Um, but it's not something like, at least we don't have companies that go head to head with like, you know, it's them pitching against Google or something, right? I think a lot of the, the problem is much more like figuring out, I think for the big tech companies and the startups, how do you figure out a product that really has resonance for, you know, uh, for the end startups? And then maybe if we get really good at that, we'll get to a world in which there's, there's a lot of direct competition between them. Right. And one very unique aspect about the competitive landscape is the dominance of electronic health record platforms, especially in the- We market. do think a lot about Epic. I think Epic is probably the most relevant, like, you know, is, is far more relevant to the world of selling into health systems than, you know, Google or Microsoft or Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up to the end of our time here. I want to touch on the macro environment. Uh, this year has been uh, an interesting one, you know, interest rates, continuing to go up, inflation continues to be high, and we don't know what uh, the demand environment is going to look like. I was listening to a podcast by a very well-known economist today. He's describing this as stagflation in the making. I don't know. I'm not an econ economist. What's your take on uh, what to expect for 2023, and what are you advising your founders? Yeah, well, I'm certainly not an economist either, so I, I will not uh, pretend to have the, uh, the 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 kind of prescient macro take. But I would say, you know, obviously there's a range of things that might happen next year, and the advice you know that we always give is, you know, there's not any, you know, there's many ways things could go. I think next year could, you know, have many of the same struggles that this year has, and so, you know, I think we tell our entrepreneurs, you know, you want to be like if the world is startlingly starts booming again, like great, you can always adjust and you know accelerate hiring and, and change things around. Uh, but you want to plan for what is a somewhat likely case, which is that things, you know, don't get a ton better next year. And so, uh, you know, luckily, you know, we, we worked with a lot of our companies to make sure they're well capitalized and can kind of, uh, you know, navigate that because I don't think anybody knows, you know, whether things go down, whether they kind of stay flat, 
Um, and you know, as, as you just want to be prepared for for whatever those uh, whatever those circumstances are. What about your firm? Are you, are you holding on to the dry powder, as they say, or, or what's your uh, outlook? Uh, we're very actively investing. I mean, I think we we just sent uh, you know two term sheets in the last two weeks. So uh, as a firm, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of the best companies get built in downturns, right? And I think you know back to where we started. Like none of the macro trends have changed. Yes, this is like a, a macro uh, a, economy change for the time being. But like the things that got us excited about healthcare a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Uh, if anything, they're more exacerbated in this type of environment. So the opportunities are very much still there. Uh, people just need to figure out on the later stage side, you know, what what are things actually worth? Wow, that is a that is a fantastic uh, uh, point of view, and uh, you know, it's a great one to uh, end on with for today's uh, podcast. Jacob, what a pleasure it was to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for shining a light on what's happening in the VC world and the startup world. Uh, all the very best to you and your team, and of course, to all your portfolio companies as well. And once again, thank you for being on the show. Thanks so much, Patty. This is a ton of fun.